in this chapter as hitherto the value of labour power and therefore that part of the working day necessary for the reproduction or maintenance of that labour power are supposed to be given constant magnitudes. In this final chapter of part three, Marx briefly defines the necessary aspects of the formation of capitalism and also summarises some of the previous key concepts on absolute surplus value while providing some theoretical laws on how it functions. With these laws and formulaic expressions, it's important to remember that for these examples, labour is being kept at the same speed and effort throughout. Firstly, let us say that a labourer working six hours a day of necessary labour time is equal to three pounds. So three pounds is the daily value of labour power, or the amount of money a capitalist must advance in order to purchase one labour power. If we now assume that for this example, the rate of surplus value or exploitation is 100%, so the labourer is working a further six hours for the capitalist, producing surplus value equal to three pound also. However, the variable capital that the capitalist must advance to purchase labour power depends on the amount of labourers they employ. So variable capital's value is the amount the capitalist must pay for one labourer times the amount of people they hire for work. If one labour power is valued at £3 and they employ 100 people, then the capitalist must advance £300. In a similar way, if the surplus value produced by one labour power is £3, then 100 labour power would produce £300. We must now take into account that the rate of surplus value or exploitation is a determining factor in this. If the labourer produces more surplus labour, say nine hours instead of six, at a rate of exploitation of 150%, then they will obviously produce more surplus value, £4.50 each instead of £3. This can then be multiplied by the number of labourers employed. So with 100 labourers, it would be £450. Marx expresses this in the formula <laughs> However, in simple terms, we can say that the mass of surplus value can be calculated by the value of one labour power, multiplied by the rate of exploitation, multiplied by the amount of labourers employed. From this, Marx now defines some laws that are observable. Firstly, that the only way a capitalist can gain more surplus value is if they increase the number of workers and or increase the length of the working day. If for some reason they have to reduce the amount of workers, then they have to extend the amount of hours worked for the rest of the labourers to get the same amount of surplus value. Similarly, if the amount of hours are reduced, they must employ more workers. Secondly, as we have seen throughout the previous chapter, the length of the working day has its limits, a point where it can no longer be extended. This means that if a capitalist were to reduce the number of labourers to a certain amount, they would not be able to extend the length of the working day for the rest of the labourers far enough to compensate for the same amount of surplus value. Thirdly, as we can see, the mass of surplus value is dependent on the rate of exploitation and the total mass of the variable capital advanced by the capitalist. It has nothing to do with the constant capital or the means of production that are advanced by the capitalist. Their whole value is simply transferred into the final product and returned back to the capitalist. Surplus value is uniquely dependent on the living labour set in motion by the capitalist. From the treatment of the production of surplus value, so far it follows that not every sum of money or of value is at pleasure transformable into capital. To effect this transformation, in fact a certain minimum of money or of exchange value must be presupposed in the hands of the individual possessor of money or commodities. Up until now throughout this series, we've only really considered all this as one circuit of production and exchange. In actuality, however, this happens over and over again. We must also take into account that the capitalist has to purchase food and clothing to reproduce themselves, and that they also have the desire to reinvest or grow their business which of course is the main purpose of capitalism. 
If the reproduction of labour power is, for example, eight hours, then the capitalist must supply the price of this plus the means of production for eight hours of work. Now let us say that the worker is providing a further four hours of surplus labour. The capitalist must now also provide a further four hours of the means of production. In this example, the capitalist would only finish with half the amount of money that the labour receives to live on for a day, half the price of labour power. To break this example down, we could say, if eight hours of labour power cost the capitalist £10 in wages, and as in our previous example, they advance the total of 12 hours worth of the means of production, let us say it cost them £15. However, remember, this value is simply transferred into the final product and is returned back to the capitalist. The money the capitalist gains as profit is the £5 surplus value from the four hours of surplus labour the worker was providing. The capitalist would only have half the amount to live off for themselves than the labourer receives. Under these conditions, the capitalist would have to employ two people to take away the same amount of money to live off as the labourer. If the capitalist only employed two people, however, the maintenance of their life would be their only motivation, not increased wealth. If the capitalist, for example, wanted to live twice as well as the labourer and also turn half of the money taken from surplus labour into further capital to grow their business, they would have to employ eight workers. The capitalist would have to advance eight times 12 hours in constant capital, the means of production, or £120 as a return in the final product, and eight labourers or £80 of variable capital. The capitalist would now end with eight times the amount of surplus labour than before, or £40, £20 of which to live on twice as well as the labourer, and £20 to use as future capital. In the Middle Ages, medieval trade guilds imposed strict laws on themselves limiting the amount of people allowed to be employed by one master to prevent against this very thing, to stop the master from becoming a capitalist. Within the process of production, as we've seen, capital acquired the command over labor, i.e. over functioning labor power, or the laborer himself. Personified capital, the capitalist takes care that the laborer does his work regularly and with the proper degree of intensity. Throughout this chapter, Marx also further defines what a capitalist actually is and briefly defines some necessary aspects of capitalism's formation. The term small master or hybrid is somewhere between labourer and a capitalist. Like those of the medieval trade guilds, it is a capitalist that also labours. In today's world, we usually think of the small business owner who employs a few other people but who is also actually involved in the labour process directly. A capitalist proper, however, is someone who is devoted to the complete control over the labour process of others. Essentially, someone who is making money entirely off of other people's labour. Capital further developed into a coercive relation, which compels the working class to do more work than the narrow round of its own life once prescribes. As a producer of the activity of others, as a pumper out of surplus labour and exploiter of labour power, it surpasses in energy, disregard of bounds, recklessness and efficiency, all earlier systems of production based on directly compulsory labour. Capitalism grows out of the production process itself. It's not something that's external to it, but the actual development of production reaches a point where capitalism takes over from within where all labour becomes under its direct command. As mentioned earlier, this is what medieval guilds impose rules to try to prevent. This command over labour is coercive. Capital forces people to be workers, to be part of the working class, and it forces them to work more and longer than they otherwise would. As we discussed in the previous chapter, capitalism is more successful at forcing people into work than any previous pre-capitalist mode of production. In those earlier systems, labour was subordinate to use values or specific purposes, whether building a pyramid or a castle or producing food for royalty. Capitalism, however, is limitless. Its goal is growth for the sake of growth, 
and so labour or the force into working is also limitless. In capitalism's command over labour, it also shifts the command of technology. The tools and machinery of the labour process no longer become a tool of the worker to produce what they want and desire in life, rather a tool or a machine that forces the labourer into work for the capitalist. In this sense, the labourer becomes subordinated to the tool or technology itself, just another cog in the machine. But this is something we'll explore more in the next section of the book.